You're all good? All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to our February 3rd general meeting of CFRI. We are so glad that everybody can be here. And um, I know everybody would, of course, like to be meeting in person, and we're looking to do that as soon as we can do so safely and have the facility to do that and all. And um, for now, we're, we're going to try and continue to put forth some really good meetings and good content for you. So let's get rolling with tonight's meeting. We go ahead and cover a couple of basic things in every meeting. And uh, one of those is that we are, of course, a non-for-profit business association. And the whole purpose here is to promote the ethical real estate investing and make sure that you know we're doing that through a lot of opportunities. And you're going to hear about some of those opportunities and, of course, learn some great, interesting information tonight as well. Here's our disclaimer just to make sure everybody's on the same page with this. Uh, obviously we are not here and I am not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV. I'm not an accountant, nor do I play one on TV. Uh, we do not give legal tax, economic or investment advice. And of course we're just claiming all of our liability for any of the actions or inactions taken or not taken. You know, the, the whole point is really in that third bullet. And that is that everybody needs to do their own due diligence. You need to find your own counsel, your own accountant, people that are well equipped to advise you in those matters because that's what it's all for that's what we do that's what we expect everybody else to do as well a couple of things about zoom uh, and this applies not just to this meeting but uh, to all of the the group and county meetings and things like that and and zoom in general I know a lot of us have probably had opportunities to be on several of them but one of the things that I know I've been seeing a lot more about in uh, various channels is uh, has the zoom etiquette fallen apart so we want to try and make sure that we keep that to the top level. Uh, a couple of things are there for a purpose, especially like advertising. And that has to do with putting things up as a background and whatnot. You have to be, you know, a CFRI member and control a property if you're, if you're going to advertise a property. When it comes to businesses, only businesses can advertise their business. And of course, that, like I said, that comes with the Zoom background and being able to have that in the background. Uh, you are not to promote any non-CFRI events uh, without, of course, permission from the executive director, which is Buffy. And, you know, you really want to make sure that anytime you're doing Zoom, not just for us, but for anybody, make sure you test everything out ahead of time. Know how you're going to use the microphone, if it works, where your speakers are. You know, do you know how to mute them? Do you know how to turn the camera off? You don't want to uh, have any unnecessary sounds or video when you don't intend to. And toward that end, make sure that when you are on a meeting where you have the opportunity to speak, that you keep yourself muted when you're not one of the people speaking. Uh, you know, these microphones, especially on computers these days, and even if you have external microphones, they pick up things really, really well sometimes. Uh, and they can be very distracting. You may not think there's any noise going on, but to everybody else, they may hear that hum or that dog or that kid or whatever it is. And that's not to say that sounds don't occur, but again, just to uh, try and make sure that you know, you're only active as a speaker when you're supposed to be active as a speaker and help reduce all of that background noise. The same thing's true is for distractions and, uh, you know, just general courtesy. I mean, that, again, that's not to say that you, if you're starving, you can't eat or something, but think about what that does when you're eating on camera for maybe some of the other people that are having to watch it. So anyway, moving right along. Uh, if you are not aware, we are uh, out there on social media. Uh, as I've said in some of the previous meetings, I'm not the biggest on social media, so I'm not the greatest person to ask when it comes to using all of those platforms, having been brought up on the uh, security side of the house where that was kind of the uh, antithesis of, of being in social media. But nonetheless, we're out there. We're on Twitter, Facebook, places like that, Meetup, YouTube. So make sure that uh, you get on some of those to connect with the other CFRI members and make sure you join the CFRI members only Facebook page to be a part of that. that is something that uh, can be very helpful. Uh, I know my wife gets a lot out of that and uh, finds all of those resources very, very helpful. We are also, if you did not know, a part of the National RIA, and we're one of the chapters. We're, of course, based in Central Florida here. We've been doing that for quite some time, 1989, when we got started. As a part of being associated with National RIA, one of the things that we have to take advantage of for all of our members 
are a bunch of very useful discounts. And I'm sure there are quite a few people on with us tonight that have taken advantage of these discounts. I know I have taken advantage of several of them myself. Uh, we're gonna talk some more about a couple of them in detail in a moment, but take a look at the screen there. You'll see some of them, especially Office Depot, Home Depot, uh, some of the other ones that are on there, they, you can get some really good discounts by being a part of that. So we're going to encourage you, if you're not a member of CFRI, you should be a member of CFRI. And not just for the discounts, you're gonna get a lot more out of it than that, but here's just one more good reason. And you can find out more about those at the CFRI website. One in particular that a lot of us use, being that we're in this industry and we typically have to buy a lot of supplies and whether that's paint or uh, stuff to fix the house up and you know whatever the supplies are, but you can be a part of that. Uh, what it involves is being uh, signing up for the program and then making sure that when you have your Home Depot access and you put your different cards online there, that you make sure that they have the code associated with them of NREA. And what that does is it makes sure that you that it gets tracked and you get a 2% rebate on your purchases. You can also participate in the paint discount, which you can see there's a 20% discount. There are other ones that they have as well. And again, you can just ask some of the folks in the group, does that work? And we will all tell you absolutely it does. And some of our folks have gotten some very impressive rebate checks on that. Hey, and on top of that, we've got a little bit later, Brian's with us. So oh, Brian yes. will be Brian. That's right. We'll that's be here right. from, from Home Depot and telling us more about the program. Yeah, so that's exciting. you guys will get to hear from Brian in just a minute and learn even more about Home Depot. So absolutely. Uh, that, Thank you, Jay and Buffy. We look forward to it. Um, I have a couple of slides ready later. No problem. Awesome. Beautiful. Uh, Office Depot and Office Max, another great one. And again, especially if you're doing things like getting stuff printed, you know, make sure you're taking advantage of these discounts. If you're one of the CFRI members, find out how to get, you know, what that purchase card does for you and use it. Again, I know several of our members uh, have gotten some excellent discounts, actually some rather amazing discounts that they were kind of surprised to get just by having those purchasing cards. So you can just text CFRI card to that number and, uh, Take advantage of it. Now, if you want to know more about uh, the membership in general, especially our business members, the people that are a part of CFRI that really help us do what we do, and uh, you know, you want to find out more, and it's not during one of our meetings where you get to see and talk to some of those business members, you can find out more about them by going to CFRI.net and checking out not just the business member directory and who they are, but of course, all the other resources and things that we'll be talking about tonight, as well as many others. Something that's going to be a little different tonight that you may or may not have heard about, and if you haven't, here's your first chance to find out about it. One of the things that's been missing, of course, is that in-person contact, but one of the other things that we used to be able to do, and we hope to get back to doing pretty soon, is being able to enjoy the meeting after the meeting. You know, one of those things where we would have our normal regular meeting at the whatever facility we're at, in case of early last year at the church, and then we would designate where we were going to go and celebrate and, of course, you know, talk and, and um, find out more and talk about deals and the associate network, all that, all that stuff that we would do. Well, we can't really do that as easily right now because, of course, it's Zoom. So uh, our VP, Stephen Young, came up with this outstanding idea that we ought to at least try to offer that opportunity to everybody. So after our regular meeting ends tonight, we are going to have a secondary Zoom that you can connect to. Kind of have to split those up so that uh, we can do that appropriately within the Zoom software, of course. But uh, we are going to have that set up and start at roughly about 8.35 and let it go until around 9.30 or, you know, if everybody's done before that, then we'll finish early. But we wanted to make sure that you had that chance to participate and network and get to know some people and ask questions and learn more. So again, it does require a new and separate Zoom link. If you have not gotten that, you can go to the website. Buffy's showing you right there on the slide. You can see it. You can go to the CFRI.net. You can click on calendar of events. And when you do that, you have access to what's going on today. There are the two events right there and she's highlighting for you exactly what you need to do. Click on the members only meeting after the general meeting. Now, hopefully you heard that little special part there. Members only 
meeting after the meeting because that is one that is an event for members only. But you will be able to register for the event and Buffy is showing you how you do it. You click there, you click pre-register and boom, it says you'll get an email about it. And of course, you can also scroll down the page and it shows you the link as well. So thank you for the guided tour, Buffy. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom has its advantages. I, that was almost like, I felt like it was my right hand. That was great. That was perfect. <laughs> so that'll be something new for tonight. Now, that is, like we said, a members only event. So if you feel like you're missing out and you're not one of our members, you need to be. And if you really thought, well, I don't know, I'm not sure. It seems kind of expensive. Maybe you want to try it out. Well, guess what? We've got a limited time offer that we are going to make available to you. Check it out. Three month trial general membership one person only, $75. And look at the little fine print down the bottom. It's three months, it expires 90, day, 90 days from the date paid. Now, Buffy, I, let me throw you a little bit of a question here. What if somebody signs up for that and they say, you know, this is so cool because they're all going to, I wanna be a member for more than 90 days. What would happen at that point? So at that point, if they change their membership to a regular membership, a 12 month membership during the three month trial period, we're gonna prorate their membership and we're gonna give them an extra $25 off. So we'll prorate the membership using the unused portion of their three month membership. And then we're gonna give them a different, an additional $25 off. They have to contact me and, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be glad to take care of that for them. That and then, is, yep. Here's That's how that. you do it. Okay. All Take right, we're on our website, go to join now. There's the information about the trial membership. Go all the way down here and click three month trial membership. Piece of cake, easy to do. So if you are not a member and you were thinking, well, I don't know, here's your chance, try it out. We're looking to have you as a part of our membership and trust us, you'll be very glad you did. And you will certainly want to stick around like all the rest of us have. Some of us have been here a long, long time. That's not me, by the way, but some of us have. <laughs> All right. One of the other resources we have available, and we'd love for you to check it out and tune into our the CFRI podcast. Uh, we have a quite a variety of people that have interviewed, and there are some amazing and interesting stories out there to check out. Uh, even our own executive director, Buffy Plowski, is on there. Uh, one of our people that is going to be hosting tonight, Tim Davis is on there. Actually, a couple of people are going to, are going to be on there tonight are on there as well. So um, definitely check that out. Uh, it's available on all the major platforms, as you saw. And uh, one of the things that we love to do as a part of our opening to the general meeting is give everybody a little bit of a taste of what's been going on you know everybody says oh this real estate stuff can you do deals what are the deals what are they like what what are some of these deals all about and i know one of the things that i really enjoy and want to know more about is what is everybody else doing and you know are all these deals are they always successful or they are sometimes maybe they're not successful and we try to give you a good selection of that and i know that one of the things you're going to get a chance to do is hear more about that in just a moment from steven but if you have a deal, we are looking to have you present a deal as well. Now, hold on. Don't just get all upset and, and worried about, oh, I don't want to present. I don't want to have to. It is not nearly as difficult as that might sound. What we really want to do is get some pictures, get some numbers, and have you have a conversation with Stephen where everybody else can learn a little bit about what you were able to do because we all are going to be able to learn from everybody's deals. And here to tell you a little bit about a little bit more about that and tell you about the night tonight's deals is our vice president, Stephen Young. Hey Jay, thanks. I appreciate that. So guys, listen, we got two excellent deals tonight, uh, two very contrasting deals for us tonight. And so without further ado, let me introduce Dave Marr. Dave, you there? Dave, you need to turn your microphone on. Yes, I'm here, sorry. All right, hey, no problem, man. We all get caught up from time to time, right? No with worries, all this Zoom right, stuff, mute, non-mute, non-mute, so. Did you get my little Wayne picture in here or what? That's all I wanna know. I did not, but I did oh. get someone in here that I think oh, you're like, so. this, <laughs> <laughs> But no problem, right. man, so, okay. So let's, so how'd you find this deal? So it's a three, two bath house, Ormond Beach. How did you come about this? 
Uh, this deal um, is a, this was a off of a probate lead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, so what did you end up doing with this? Was this a buy and hold or was it fix and flip? What, what this are we is just doing a here? straight fix and flip, man. Nothing, nothing fancy or nothing creative. This was just a, um, you know, get on with the phone with the seller, negotiate the deal. I bought the deal for cash, rehab the house, and sold it. Okay, good. So before we go to the next slide, what motivated you to do the deal? Like, what about the probate piqued your interest? And you're like, hey, I got to jump on this. Mm, the money. <laughs> yeah okay all right that's fair fair game the money if it wasn't for the money i wouldn't know any of you guys on here trust me man <laughs> no, i'm just kidding but um yeah no it was a good deal actually um i mean you know you're always everybody's always looking for good deals i'm just kidding but this one uh it just like hit a lot of the the boxes that i look for and everything like that um ormond beach which is just blazing hot i mean everywhere okay. is but ormond beach is really good and i tend to look for like days on market you know what i mean first like because i'm a lot of people are interested in like how much money they make on flips i'm more interested in how much time like deal take me so uh for example ormond beach really good days on market really fast pretty cookie cutter like it was just mm -hmm. it was just really pretty all the way around okay very good all right next yeah. slide Okay, great. So cookie cutter, get in there quick, do what you got to do. So purchase price, 115, not yeah. bad. Uh, after repair value, 240, estimated repairs, 40K. So yeah. uh, just for some people that are fairly new, can you just explain the after repair value? Yeah, so the after repair value is just, um, you mean like how you come about it or? Yeah, well, what is it and then how you come about it? Yeah, so the after repair value is basically if you're looking at a house that you know needs a bunch of work, the after repair value is just you know the the selling price of or what you think the selling price should be after it's all fixed up and kind of pretty, you know. So the easiest okay. way to do that is just kind of you know do comparables uh, through what other properties in the area have sold for. Okay, very good. So I see a pretty big. Uh contrast here between what it was and where it is at now what was yeah. the condition of the home you know when you arrived and started to formulate kind of a statement of work what did that look like yeah it was bad um this house was actually really bad and, the, the, and this this had squatters when i got there oh. um oh this, my gosh. yeah this had squatters living in the house and actually why i um when I believe that was like the big deal, you know, because in order to get, in order to get really fat deals, which is what I try to do, you know, where you make 60, 70, 80, hundred K on a, on a deal. Okay. Um, you, you have to really be kind of solving problems. Like you can't just be, it's usually not the money. It's the, you gotta find like what their real problem is. So on this particular property, um, the, the sellers lived out of state and they had squatters in there and that was just killing them, bro. Wow. That was the big problem. So I believe actually when I first shot out of the gate at this, we were at 122, but then in, I was going to take it like kind of with the squatters. And then in order to help the family remove the squatters, they, I, I worked that down to 115. They lowered it, you know what I mean? Okay, in exchange great. for getting the squatters out. So that, that helped me with a couple grand. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into the next slide. So I yeah. want to talk a little bit about the repair. So I didn't anticipate you saying that there were squatters in the home. So yeah, it was wrecked. Fleas, everything, man. It was, it was, it was, it was really, it was, a, it was a pretty gross house. Oh my gosh. So what was your biggest challenge, I guess, when it comes to the repairs and staying on budget with everything? Um, <clears throat> You know, on this one, oh, it's not the same, man. For me personally, I'm pretty good with the budgets and everything. The biggest problem is the workers. Usually, I like I hate to say it, but it's mm. keeping the workers on the. That's always the problem. The, you know what I mean? As far as it's like, for example, removing the wall or or doing something like that is never the problem. It's dealing with the guys who are going to remove the wall. That's always the issue. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. just trying to keep your workforce engaged and motivated yeah, man. and doing Try what to keep everybody to alive and everything like that. You know what I mean? This house, the only, the only real like cosmetic change that we did is 
there, if you see in that picture right there where that pantry door is, that was like a big wall that came over to like where the end of that island is. So we just took that okay. out and opened it up. That, that was the only thing we did. Okay, very good. So time frame from beginning, I guess when you started the demo until you completed it, how long did that take you? Four weeks. Really? Yeah. Wow. So is that a result as a result of you having just a super awesome team? Like, can I no, call man. HGTV and, you know, you're just like those flipper flop guys or what? I mean, that's pretty amazing. I rock and roll, bro. That's it. You know what I mean? That's it. The time is really the money. The, the, the time, the money, the time game is the money game. That's the secret. The time game is the, the money game is not the money game. It's the time game. It's not whether you make five, 10, 50 or a hundred thousand or a million dollars. It's how fat, how long is it taking you to make this money? That that's like, for me, how I gauge everything. So, um, uh -huh. like I pretty much rock and roll, you know what I mean? So, and I, most of the people that work with me know that if they're going to work with me, uh, we get busy. So, you know. Okay, good. So they'll know they'll have work coming and they'll stay active and yeah. And then I run pretty much everything. So I try to do my part and I'm pretty active in most, most of I'm pretty active as far as like making sure that everything is there, materials there, everything is lined up, everything, you know, is where it needs to be so that we can move. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. All right. So let's talk about that massive number down there that you made. So you sold yeah. it. And I, I, what I find amazing when I look at this is obviously the profit is pretty spectacular, but the sold price was right in line, right in target with your ARV. And then the holding costs, which you alluded to earlier. Um, and I, I, I have a question about that too. Uh, you know, what motivated you to fund this yourself? So first let's talk about the sold price. Okay. How are you so spot on? And then we'll go through those other two questions. You know what? I don't, um, it's not rocket science, man. It's really not. You know what I mean? I'm kind of like a price per square foot guy at the end of the day, you know? So I kind of like, um, you know, I, I think that I just try to, you know, I take the comps and I look at them and I really am pretty like honest with them as, as far as like, you know, what my property has that other ones don't have or what other properties do have that mine does. And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty like dry and very, uh, objective okay. when it comes to comps um i don't get like too emotional with my houses it's very numbers and then i just do a price per square foot it kind of comes on and i usually ballpark low so like this house i had the arv like right there around 240 is what i thought my right. number was like 218 where i was like okay if i if i'm out of there at 218 like i'll you know i'll do the deal but i thought it would sell for 240 you know what i mean so i'm always like sure doing my numbers on a on a much less sales price, but uh, I thought I'd probably get that. Okay, very good. And so back to the holding price now, or the holding cost, I should say. Yeah. You mentioned that you fund the deals yourself. What, what makes you decide to do that? Because, you know, I don't personally flip houses, but I know in this industry, a lot of people are using private lending, hard money. Yeah. What's the motivation here, Dave? You got to come on. Well, <clears throat> That's a, that's a, um, I think everybody's different on that, man. I think mm -hmm. in any, you know, well, okay. See, for me as a house, like as a rehabber, you know, I don't really, I'm not necessarily in the real estate business, man. I'm in the money business is really what I'm in. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not, I'm in the money business. I'm like the asset manager. I like buy the asset I manage the asset while I increase the value and then I dispose of the asset. What the asset is, it doesn't really matter. It's a house, it's this, it's, you know, whatever. So like, as far as the money, I think that there's certain times where you want to be, depending on market and conditions, you want to be like lean and mean and like uber profit. Like, you know what I mean? Versus mm -hmm. being kind of like very leveraged out where you're doing a lot of volume, but the numbers are down. So like, if you go over, let's say 2020 and even till now, if you're flipping houses, I don't know where anybody else is at, but I, I think in our area here, like 
there's a lot of there's a lot of deals right now. And see, actually, what's interesting is a lot of people are saying there's not a lot of deals. There's mm -hmm. actually shitloads of deals. I got more deals than I can even put work on. But the okay. but there's a lot of competition. Sure. So like right now, I think that you know, and and last year you wanted to be very fast to the deals and very quick and super decisive and get them and just crack like no yeah. singles, man, all home runs, all triples, everything like that. So for me, just where I was, I just wanted to be like super lean, really fast, really efficient, really high profitability, 40, 50% returns on every deal. So in order to do that, I have to like fund myself and just roll with it. Okay. Awesome. Great answer. I love that, man. Very yeah. good. Awesome. All right. So profit. So obviously you, you hit your goals there and you made your profit. So let's go to the next slide and kind of wrap things up here. Yeah. Um, so there it is. See, I, I didn't give you a little way. Ah, you got the you got rock. The rock. Come on. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> so that's the finished product there. It looks beautiful. It's amazing. I see why they spent 240 odd thousand for it. So great job. So mm -hmm. what did you enjoy most about this deal? I mean, obviously the money, but what did you, what else, like what lesson can you pull out of it that you can share with everybody? Um, mm, a lesson that I can pull, well, see, and this is interesting, like, um, cause I think, I think things may be changing literally as we speak right now, you know what okay. I mean? It, it's very quick moving, but, um, I think just go for it, man. We have a super strong market and I think right now, there's a, I hear a lot of people saying there's no deals out there or there's not a lot of deals. There are so, there's more deals now than I think there's ever been. The, the thing is, there's just, a, there's a lot more competition. Sure. Everybody's a wholesaler. Everybody's a drop shipper and a house flipper and all this other stuff, right? Everybody's a, a you know, this kind of thing. But um, there's a lot of competition. I think if you can just find a way to like, you have to beat the competition. You have to be faster, better at negotiating, get your deals way lower than all, everybody else is getting them and more room. And I think if you just go for it, man, there's a lot of money to be made. I think in 2021, there, you could absolutely crush it. You could be doing a million. You could make, you could, you could make a million in 2021 without that much problem, I believe. Awesome. I like that. Love to hear that. Yeah, super. Honey, flipping houses, million dollars. Yeah. It's not that hard. Let's do it. All right. That's super motivational. Okay. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. I may start flipping, but in any case, guys, oh, if you have questions, go ahead and I forgot to mention in the beginning, but in the Q and a box, not the chat box, the Q and a box, if you have a question for Dave, go ahead and post that there. And also for Peter, who's coming up next, as we're talking, if you have questions, go ahead and post those there. So looks like we're getting a few questions come in and we'll tackle those. So uh, let's see, the first one, great deal. And the question is, was he targeting probates mailing letters? Yeah, you know what's funny about this is I got this guy on direct mail and I got him on Facebook targeting, I have a, Tar uh, Facebook that's set up to target on probate and I got them on both. Okay, cool. The same lead. So, you know what I mean? The same lead got me on faith. He came in through Facebook uh -huh. and he came in on direct mail. So I had him on two channels. Good deal. Mm -hmm. All right. And this question popped up a few times. How did you remove the squatters? <laughs> um, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that the, the and actually, Dave, before you answer that, yeah. somebody else added to that question and said, did the fact that we're under COVID restrictions and the fact that there's no evictions, did any of that come into play as you tried to get them out? Oh, you, yeah. You, yeah, it's wild. It's wild. So the sellers were having, yeah, the sellers that I bought it from, they were having problem with the COVID, okay, because of the restrictions. They, they were in the process of getting uh, him booted out. You know what I mean? And, and actually he wasn't technically an, an eviction because he never had like a lease, you know what I mean? So he was, <clears throat> he was being removed, but um, they couldn't because Volusia County, which where this was had shut down and all that kind of stuff. And then it was <clears throat> right. That's what kind of, I told him, listen, you know, if we can work on the price, I'll get him out. And I just, um, you know, man, I just do, I have my ways. I went out to the house 
And uh, Mm -hmm. because the guy was pretty much a jerk. So I went out to the house. I actually talked with his wife and we just chatted and then they left that night. So that was, you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So that was that. So I got him out of that. All right. So I'll take just a few more because guys, remember, we do have another deal of the month coming up as well. So um, once we wrap up here, I'll have Dave uh, provide his contact info and uh, you can pick his brain some more. Uh, Or if you're a member, attend the meeting of the meeting. Maybe Dave might be there. I don't know. Yes. So, okay. Uh, let's see. This is a good one. Did you use hard money before you had your own or how did you start out? So you said you funded it yourself. What, how did you get going here? You know what? I, I, I normally fund all my deals, man, myself. I, I usually fund all of it and everything like that. I usually fund all my deals. Um, so which- did you, so did you have like a nine to five and you just saved an incredible amount of money and then said, okay, yeah, I'm now I, in a position to move forward. Yeah, I did. I sold okay. timeshare and I just, oh. I happened to be good at that, man. I made boatloads of money doing that. And I was, and I pretty like, I was good with fine. I didn't blow all my money. So I did, Smart. I had saved some money and everything like that. And uh, so I, I use a lot of that. I, I use, it's not that I don't use money, but I don't, like a lot of people borrow money because they don't have the money. I don't think right. that's a great way to start. If I use financing, I'm leveraging because, you know what I mean? Because I'm like scaling. It's not because I don't, if I'm borrowing a hundred grand from you, like, dude, I have the hundred K mm-hmm. for sure. You know what I mean? But there, right. there might be other things, you know what I mean? Where I'm going to take you in and say, listen, if you want to go in on this together, but I rarely, I don't think I ever borrow money that I don't have if that makes sense no no it 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 definitely does that definitely yeah. makes sense okay let's see so two more these are the final two guys and then uh we got to keep going here so move forward all right so what's working for you on market marketing right now what's working for you i guess marketing right now right. it changed uh, well i mean everything works i mean everything still work i mean you know direct mail works the internet works Facebook ads works i mean google works driving for dollars works everything kind of works you know i think that what i would recommend though for people is like try to just dial in on maybe one channel if you're just starting out like just pick one channel that you can master i think a lot of people are trying to do too much you know what i mean maybe it's it's if you're just starting out you're not going to conquer like six or seven marketing channels at a time you got to like pick one and just make traction on it, traction on it, traction on it until you develop skills. Because the issue right now is competition. You, it's not, can you do it? It's, can you do it better than the guys that are already on lock in that channel? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you have to like really get good at one thing. So some people are, you know, they're great on the internet or great at, you know, doing mail or great at driving or, you know, a lot of, everything works, but, um, for mine, it's a combination of like a lot of Facebook targeting and a lot, I end direct mail. I get a lot of deals out of that. And then okay. I network, actually, I, I network with a lot of wholesalers as well. I buy from a lot of people too. Okay, great. Very good. So last question and uh, let's see here. So where does the flipper incorrectly spend money fixing up a flip? And then to that, where should you know, a house flipper spend the money fixing up the flip. So where do they spend the money incorrectly? Like, where is it wasted as opposed to where should they actually be investing the dollars? Yeah, good question. I would say, um, well, for me, I think the first things are whatever you're going to need so that it gets financed. You know what I mean? So like, for example, if the house needs a roof and ACs or any type of system, anything that the buyer is going to need to get a loan. Those are first priority. And then uh, after, you know, after that, you know, it's the basic stuff. I mean, I I think kitchens are still in. Right. Kitchens. Yeah. Yeah. Kitchen. I think uh, for me, I floor plan, like I'm after the systems are in, like, so once, once the roof and everything, once I'm cleared, I know I'm clear with bank and buyers can get a loan on my house. The next thing I go to is floor plan so that I can maximize the space. You know what I mean? On the floor plan. And then once I have the floor plan, then it's like kitchens, bathrooms, paint, you know? All right. 
Very good. Awesome. Well, this has been incredible, enlightening. So you, you uh, dropped some things here, knowledge and information that I hadn't even anticipated. So uh, yeah. what's your contact information in case somebody wants to reach out to you, learn a little bit more about how this works? You have yeah, uh, some you, contact information you don't mind sharing? You, yeah. You want me to just say it? Yeah, just say it. And then you can put it in the chat. You know, when uh, you guys here. can text me. Anybody that wants to do deals or anybody wants to and I'm always looking to work. I work with, I, I, I work, I don't want to say I work with anybody, but I find a way to like, try to work with a lot of people. Um, 407. So you guys can call me, text me 407-212-1415 is my number. And if you want to email, it's Dave at Florida flip And I could okay. probably throw it in the chat if you want to, I'll throw it in the chat too. Yeah. Go ahead and put it in the chat for us. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, hey, Dave, this has been excellent, man. Thank you. For... One, one quick thing. This could be a oh, testimonial. Brian uh, just asked from Home Depot, um, sent, me a sent me a text and asked me if, Dave, are you a part of the Pro Rewards program? Dude, so I need to be. I Yeah. Every time I go there. Well, see, here's my issue. Yeah, I got to get hooked up with it. I just was talking with the girl in New because I live in New Smyrna Beach. I just had like a 20 minute conversation with her this morning. I, I feel like I try to do it, but every time I come to the get to get checked out, man, it's like we're in outer space. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, you know? well, you might want to hang I'm around. I'm talking with Sally, at the lady at that works there, and she don't know what I'm talking about, and she's mad because I'm asking her questions. I mean, well, that's what happened. Brian, Brian's presentation is going to come up um, right after the next deal of the month, so you might want to stick around it. and so you can hear what Brian has to say because I know there's frustration from other people, and and Brian's going to try to walk us through how we can all take advantage of the rebate money that's there from Home Depot. So, I think it's fantastic. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Back to you, awesome. Stephen. All right, no problem. Thanks, Buffy. All right, thanks again, Dave. Appreciate thank you me. taking the time. Absolutely. All right, so now uh, we're gonna invite Peter Lopez, uh, the current uh, Director of Operations for CFRI. We're gonna welcome him to the, uh, to the stage now. Thank you for having me. So let's see. All right, are you up, Peter? Yep, you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're a little low, but I think I think we can make out what you're saying. Let's see. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and move forward and hopefully the volume will uh, get better here. So, all right, Peter. So similar to Dave, you also had a fix and flip, but uh, things went a little bit differently. So first off, let's talk about just like I do with Dave, you know, how did you get this deal? How'd you find the deal? Well, this deal is, is kind of a, the complete opposite of what Dave just told us. Uh, <clears throat> I found this deal um, on MLS. I'm a okay. real estate agent, and I, when I'm um, on looking for deals, I just do searches, you know, three times a week or so, every other day. Okay, so you just search for it. All right, great. So this home looks quite old. What's the age of this home? 1989. Okay, so not too bad. It's just a quite a unique structure uh, that's here. So was it primarily wood, wood paneling? Uh, the ground floor. It's a two story, uh, like a, a French chalet. Is the ground floor is concrete, even okay. though th that's wood that you see in front. That's just for decoration. Uh, uh, the the ground floor is concrete. The upper floor was wood. Okay, very good. All right, next slide, Buffy. So as we transition to the next slide, the condition of the home. So Dave had squatters. I mean, looking at the comparison here, you obviously did a fantastic job, but what was the condition of this place? Did you have any sort of issues like squatters or was there anything else unique about this that made it? Uh, uh, besides the, the neighbor next door was uh, kind of a drug addict and kind of a oh, crazy wow. guy, but uh, no, no squatters on it. It was, I believe this one, if I recall, I don't recall exactly, it was a uh, bank owned. I think it was an uh, REO. I don't remember exactly. Okay, banked on. So that probably kind of hints at why the price was so low, correct? Um, yes, it was listed for 65. Uh, six, six to six five. Uh, offer my fir first offer came in at, at sixty. If they counter at sixty three, we close at sixty three. 
and uh, or 63.5, and then I got paid a commission as a real estate agent. So the purchase price was just 61 something, 61.700 or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So with this property, how long did it take you from when you started, you know, renovating to, you know, completion? What's the time frame there? Oh, this is this was a kind of very complicated deal for me because um, I um, started the job, the demolition on it. Uh -huh. uh, uh, quite a few mistakes on it. And uh, while I was working with the permitting for the roof, the AC and the electrical, I brought in the, the remodel crew to start okay. the demolition and I brought in the, the dumpster. Happens the, that the city hall is just two blocks away and about like in the fourth, fifth day of the of work, not even a week, the inspector stopped by and stopped the whole thing. Oh, wow. And they told us, you know, I want everybody out. If I see people working here, I will find you, you know, until you get a, a GC and, uh, and do the whole thing from, uh, you know, we want a GC. Okay, very good. So let's go, that kind of transitions us into the next slide with the repairs. So uh, they stopped work. Uh, you needed to find a GC. So the, I, I guess the original crew that you had, you know, um, you know, they didn't meet those qualifications that uh, the inspector was looking for. So what's the time period from when you stopped until you were able to actually start up work again? Uh, about like four months. What? what? <laughs> yeah, about four months it was closed. Really? Yeah, what happened was that the, the uh, since uh, the crew I brought in uh -huh. started working and uh, they did the demolition, open up some walls that needed repairs. And um, um, they were working, uh, you know, quite fast. Okay. Um, and uh, we had a, a, um, a time frame, you know, the, the, the timeline to get the job done was just about 30 days. So they were working pretty fast, but since uh, the, the city got in, stop the whole thing um okay. it was quite a, a challenge for me to get a gc willing to work with my crew because i had already gave them an advance you know and uh and i was not um creative enough to work around the city the city inspector and try to convince him to you know listen i have a permit i'm working with a, a licensed roofer working with a licensed electrician i'm working with a license uh, HVAC company. So right. why don't you allow me to finish up this job? You know, but um, it just I I kept waiting and looking for the for a GC, and uh, it took me quite a while. Took quite some time. Yeah, I definitely see that here, and I think that may have obviously contributed to your repairs estimate ballooning. You know, almost to twenty additional thousand dollars. So. Obviously you had more time that was built in that you hadn't planned for, but what about the work? I, I know me and you talked a little offline. Did you have to bring in a whole new crew uh, yeah. in order to, I guess, meet the requirements? Yeah, you know, the, when, the when I brought in the guy, the, the crew back, uh -huh. uh, um, you know, they, they had contracted other jobs and uh, they were just dragging their feet. And I was against, uh, you know, against the clock was already like my fifth month on, on the job. And we're basically starting from scratch on the fifth month. So they were just dragging their feet. And we're starting having some arguments. And oh, okay. Long short, uh, they just left. You know, they just left. They disappeared on me. So I had to uh, bring an, uh, another crew, which okay. started right away. We kind of... Uh, uh, they were working at a fair pace, but uh, sloppy job here, sloppy job there, you kind of redo things all around. So um, and then we got it done, but uh, it took us a while. Um, some other issues that came up with the city, because since it's uh, within the city limits, they mm -hmm. had uh, historical district requirements that we had to, met, to meet. Um, and um, you know, basically working with the city was uh, was kind of a uh, slow. Uh, that is, 
kind of, um, you know, it took much more time that, that I expected based on my previous deals, you know? Sure, right. Uh, and so, okay, let's go to the next slide. And you did mention, so this wasn't your first deal, right? So let's, no. let's let that be clear. You are, you know, uh, an investor, you've been doing this for some time. This was actually deal number, what, seven for you, I believe you told me? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, number seven. And I've done quite a few for, for my clients. You know, I'm a real estate agent. Uh, I've been involved between mine and my clients around fairly easy, like 20, around, around 20 deals as an agent, as a buyer's agent or as a listing agent, you know? And uh, so it was um, it just, I lost control. I lost control of the, the whole transaction because I was not prepared. You know, I, I thought I had everything under control and right. it, it came coming up back to me with surprise after surprise after surprise after surprise. At the same time, we were going through some family issues with uh, some health issues with uh, with uh, some relatives. That was uh, my mind, my my psyche was not entirely on, on on the job, you know. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you were telling me that. And so, what I love about this story too is, although you got, you know, you only made a thousand dollars and you know, we may not have really have made that at the end of the day when you start to tally up all the receipts, but this one deal didn't define you and you're still here. You're the, the director of operations and you're still proceeding forward and still doing what you need to do, uh, which is excellent. And so I commend you for that. Uh, the one thing I wanna point out on this slide here though, however, is personal. That's something that we don't see very often here. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's something that people don't yeah. think about as they're just getting started or as they're doing things. So let, let's talk about that expense a little bit. You know, Steven, this is something for me is quite important as being part of uh, being blessed and having the opportunity of being part of the club. Uh, uh, I, I believe I, I learned so much being, being part of, uh, of this club. And I believe it's part of our responsibility to, you know, uh, bring quality education for, for our membership. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, we're very happy and glad and we celebrate when, when our members have killer deals and the one that they just told us, show us, right? Yep. But yep. this is reality as well, you know? And, and for a guy like me, I don't have much money, you know? Uh, I, I work the complete opposite on it. I try to, to risk the least amount of my own money, right? So like this mm -hmm. deal, for example, I bought it with a 10% down, 90, 10. And I paid three points for origination and, and uh, um, at a 9%, right? Yep. Still. Um, I try the, the, the risk, the least amount of money so I can use the, I can use more effectively the, the money that I have on other deals that might came up, right? I don't want to sure. lose you know, the uh, uh, loss of opportunity. So in this case, since uh, once the, this guy left and disappeared on me and the second crew came in and it was so, they were walking on it. They were, you know, trying to, uh, uh, to come up to speed, mm -hmm. but, uh, the truth is that uh, uh, not the guy who was in charge of the crew, but the other two, two or three people that he, he brought in, they were all, you know, oh my God. It, uh, not good. So I had to basically for the last, I don't know, two, three weeks, I had to go to the job site almost every day. So I had to put aside my, my retail practice as a realtor to take care of this deal. So I just wanted I was already emotionally uh, exhausted, you know. Mm -hmm. I just wanted out of my hands. Um, and uh, when I came up with the with the the ARV was kind of solid um, on it. And yeah, uh, it was. It was spot on, actually. It's it's, it's you know it's actually the it, I was conservative. The the uh, the, uh, the comp supported uh, something around one fifty five. So mm -hmm. I just let it go, let it go. So I just wanted to let it. Let, let it out of my hands. So those twenty nine hundred dollars is actually I came up with. The, let me let me think about this. This this job site is sixty six miles away from my house, mm. and my car, my mm -hmm. my truck, it gives me around twenty three miles per gallon on the highway. So do the math back and forth. Right. For about total about twenty some days, three weeks or so. Uh, food, you know, that's something that we don't most people don't account for. So my advice for those agents that, you know, I mean, those 
uh, members that are starting, uh, please take in consideration how far away from your from your home is is, is the job site. That is that is cost uh, coming out of your pocket as well. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. So you kind of stole my question already. I was going to ask, you know, what was your advice to others just starting out? So obviously you went through tremendous struggle, but you can see here from this last slide that the house looks beautiful. I mean, you did it, you got it completed. So, you know, what, what advice do you have for other folks that you know, maybe going through the same struggle right now as we speak? And how do they overcome the obstacles? Well, um, I, um, this deal, I, I got like an overconfident. Um, I over, uh, the truth is that I um, overlooked some, um, some um, issues on the house. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, and then on top of that, the honest truth that happened, kind of weird stuff that happens that was, they were not, supposed to happen based on my previous experience with the other deals and the deals with my clients. Gotcha. Like, uh, uh, like um, the repair on the second floor, it, at the end of the day, it, it was uh, 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 ripped off and re instead of a repair, we had to do basically the upper wall completely to the oh, stud. Okay, wow. That's the kind of thing was, wasn't accounted for. Um, so, I would say to the new new folks to um, uh, be mindful of where the, the the deal is. If it's a second story, your cost will definitely will increase. Absolutely will increase. You know when you need to a crane to fix up the walls and such or repair windows, that is uh, some cost that is it may not be accounted for. Um, and um, and uh, and just uh, if it's within a star district. Mm -hmm. Start by pulling the permits. Don't try to be you know, <laughs> just a wise guy and um, just right. Don't wait if you can do it now. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Peter. So we're going to open it up for uh, questions. Let's see here. Via the Q and A. Yep. Talk yes. That's via Q and A. Yep. Don't forget, guys. Q and A section down there at the bottom. So, okay, what qualifications did the inspector require? At the beginning, just a GC. I want a GC on, involved in this deal. Uh, sure. So after about that fourth month that I was still struggling to get a GC to get in, uh, get the job, uh, into the job, I went back to him. I told him, listen, uh, I, need a, uh, I need you to work with me on this deal. Um, you know, I have a, the electrician, it's a licensed electrician, the AC guys, are, uh, uh, you know, AC company, the roofers uh, is a electrical company. Mm -hmm. I know that we talked about the, the remodel. He told me, uh, uh, you know, two permits for the plumbing on the kitchen and on the bathrooms and for the, for the uh, remodel as a whole. But uh, how about it? Uh, you know, I don't have a, I, I can find a, a, a licensed plumber to do the, pull the permits, but uh, I need your, uh, you know, to work with me on this. Otherwise, um, you know, I won't be able to get it done. And, and, uh, so he agreed. So okay. So as long as you pull, you make sure you pull the premise. I want to see him. Right. So uh, then they they work with me, and uh, as long as I kept uh, the facade of the house as uh, as original as it was, even though this is not a historical home. That's why right. one of yeah. my arguments I have with this is not a historical home. It was built in 1989, uh, but still, you know, this is store district. You cannot touch the facade. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, Next questions, and these two kind of tie together. They're coming from the same person, so I'm just going to do them both. Uh, your holding cost is very high compared to the previous deal of the month, which I believe you alluded to really with the, the GC issues. Uh, and then also, what would you do next time to reduce the cost? So holding cost is very high, so just touch on that briefly. And then what can you do to basically reduce those costs moving forward? On this kind of deal? Yeah. Uh, Time is of the essence, you know, when mm -hmm. you're uh, leveraging, uh, you know, you do the math, you have a 9% monthly interest, uh, if you do a, a hard money loan on it, you need to get in and out as quick as possible, as quick as, as possible. So when I do the bud these budgets, I, I do 
the like the worst case scenario that I imagined was a six month holy period. That was not the case. I, I held this house for a year. Oh and wow! It, while then at the end when it was on the market for sale, I had to uh, uh, you know fix some stuff that came up during the inspection. Because at the end of the day, I'm on this on the long run. This is what I do for a living, and uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I deliver, uh, uh, you know, a quality quality product. Uh, a, a product. Yeah. Whoever lives in this house, I don't remember the name. This is a almost new home, you know, from the ground up. Even the stereo walls and that out on the second floor. Everything is new. Okay, very good. And that answers the next question, I believe. Someone wanted to know, did you restore the ceiling? So because the ceiling's wood there, they wanted to know, did you do it and how? But sounds like me. Yeah, the ceiling. So there's like wood, looks like there's wood paneling of some sort on the ceiling. On this photo? Yeah, in that photo. Oh, no, this photo is, is this, this wood was just in perfect shape. No. Okay. So you didn't uh, have to do anything. No, no, that's what's in perfect shape. The roof was, was uh, how to re uh, redo the roof. Okay, very good. So let's see here. I think you answered this already, but I'll ask it again, just in case somebody missed it. Uh, what would you caution a new investor about regarding their first flip? Don't overlook uh, simple stuff that's just common sense. You see the, in front of the house, you see like the, that bit uh, tree stuck there. Mm-hmm was a huge, I mean, it was easily 40 feet above the roof line of the house. It was a big, big, big tree. And uh, it, and it was, it seems to me, was fairly okay with it. But then uh, a big, thick branch broke and perforated the roof, destroyed the roof like two weeks after it was done. So don't overlook simple stuff like that, you know? Uh, if, 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 if you see something suspicious, don't expect that it's going to be okay. Get it done. Get it done. Um, and, uh, and if you have already, if you come up, you have already your, your crew, uh, that, you know, that has been doing jobs with them fairly reasonable, mm -hmm. You know, don't get, don't, don't let the, the, the greed and, uh, uh, and your pride get in the middle and hire another person, hire another crew that you don't know them. You have not, uh, uh, you know, you have not worked with them uh, because it will come, it may come back to you and bite you. Okay. Uh, gotcha. Steven, we're going to need to kind of yep. wrap it up and move along. So maybe give Peter one more question and let him give his contact info and we'll right. move along. Man, you stole my thunder, Jay. I was sorry, about to do I'm that. Sorry. Come on, come on. <laughs> No, I, yeah, Peter, there's a ton of questions here, like no joke. So um, last one, and then you'll have your contact info and then we'll move forward. So I really like this question. I think you answered it, but let's go ahead and ask it again. Are you still flipping or have you stopped since the sale of this house? I haven't done anyone, uh, no, uh, any other deals um, uh, after this one. I'm really busy on the retail side now um, you know, with, uh, with retail customers. But uh, I'm getting ready. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, my goal is to make uh, uh, at least five deals this this year. Okay. Awesome. Great. Excellent. So, Peter, hey, we appreciate you talking through this deal. A lot of people will not get up here and do what you did and talk about a deal that didn't go so well. So, we appreciate you for taking the time to do that. So, because there's so many questions, uh, what's the best way for folks to contact you? By email. Uh, it could be a realtor. Uh, realtor.peterlopez at gmail.com um, and uh, just keep an eye because um, I have a ready presentation ready for this deal there's a lot of more uh, uh, knowledge and learning opportunity on this deal that I want to share with the membership okay very good excellent all right uh, very good so uh, with that Jay I'm handing it off to you my friend all right. Sorry about stealing your thunder there, Stephen. Yeah, it's okay. It's and okay. Um, Peter, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second and putting your uh, information in the chat as well, just so people have that, that would be great. And uh, like, like Stephen said, you know, one of the things that we really liked about having both of those deals tonight is just the fact that, again, you know, they don't always go the way you think they're going to go. Sometimes they're, you know, home runs. Sometimes they aren't. 
but that's just it. We get back up there, we try again, we learn, we move on. And Peter said something to us earlier, and that is, you know, you may not earn, but you're definitely going to learn. So you're going to get something out of it no matter what. And uh, definitely applaud him for doing that. Now, we promised you that you are going to have a chance to learn about the Home Depot plan, and you are absolutely going to do that. So without further ado, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell everybody who you are, a little bit about you, and uh, then we'll get into uh, the main presentation after that. Sounds great, Jay. Thank you for the opportunity and Buffy. I appreciate you coordinating and helping us manage for me to have a chance to speak with the CFRI uh, membership and then prospective members as well. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say, Stephen, awesome job in coordinating that presentation with Dave and uh, Peter. I was very pleased to see what's happening in the Orlando market and just um, exciting to see both sides of the perspective. Um, a lot of learnings there. I think for us all um, of operational efficiencies and just uh, the stories that they presented. So super inspiring and, and thank you for that. So I'm gonna be brief, um, I'll try to be bright and then I'll be gone. And what we'll do is if there's any questions, if it's okay, I'd love to join the VIPs uh, meeting after at 8.30 and be around for a little bit to answer any questions. So uh, Jay, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Brian Aguirre. I'm the national account manager for the Home Depot uh, stores, the Home Depot Pro, also known as our professional services side of the business where we sell materials and services to you, the professional customer, um, for our partnership with the National Real Estate Investors Association. So um, I directly manage our relationship with CFRI. So um, today what I'm going to do is briefly just talk to you about our program. Um, and Buffy, if it's okay to share a couple slides, I have a couple of slides I can share. If, if not, we could always breeze through. Now, uh, can you can you go on and share those? Can you put your share? You should be able to share. There you go. There we go. So um, what I'm going to share is a quick couple of slides that go over the member benefit that you receive for being a member of CFRI. So for those of you that are not members, Again, the objective here is we really believe at the Home Depot that if you become a member, there's a community here of like-minded individuals that have experienced and understand um, you and understand your desire to be on this journey to become a real estate investor and add value to people's lives. Um, I think Dave said it best today. We see that the opportunities at the Home Depot are for us to help you solve challenges, right? Add value to your business and best serve your needs. So our stores have what's called a pro desk. And if you've never shopped by the pro desk, I think if there's a headline takeaway today, I would love for you to think of stop by the pro desk in your local store and build a relationship to what Dave said. He mentioned there was someone at the store that was working with him and there was a company said, well, they don't know about the Home Depot program we have with CFRI. That's actually a good thing. The reason why is you need to become a member to understand about the specifics of this program. But at a higher level, Jay briefly touched on it. Um, if you're a member of CFRI, we actually offer um, you a 2% rebate on all sales every six months once you spend over $5,000 um, at our stores. So that's one of the key benefits. We also have our bid room at the store where you can take all of your material order needs, bring them to our associates at the pro desk, and receive a quote with deeper savings on everything you're buying that can really help you save money on the project. So for the essence of time, I will not show this video, but uh, on this slide is a simple video that goes through the registration process. And quite simply, um, we have a tool called Pro Extra at the Home Depot that allows you to better and easily manage your business when shopping with us at our stores. So if you are a buy and hold investor, or if you're a fix and flip investor, we really believe, and the data shows that Pro Extra, I'm gonna show it to you here on my phone, is a valuable, powerful tool to help you increase operational efficiency. Why? It tracks your receipts, um, allows you to do phone sales, authorize purchases for your runners and your teams at the store, and so on. And then also gives you access into the bid room at the local store, which you definitely wanna take advantage of as well. But to receive the 2% rebate um, on all your sales, you have to become a member of CFRI, you have to register for Pro Extra and you have to add an agreement code to your custom, to your profile, right? All these things have to happen in order to take advantage of that one exclusive member benefit. And then another benefit 
is you actually get uh, moved up to our 20% off of liquid paints and stains from dollar one. Brian, what does that mean? Essentially, me as a customer of Home Depot as well, um, not a, a per professional, I can take advantage of this. Um, I have to spend upwards of $8,000 to get 20% off of paint. You as a member, working with Buffy, they can move you right to the head of the line with that and you get 20% off on the kills primers you need, liquids, paints and stains from Bayer and from PPG, some of the leading paint brands um, for, that you could use for your business needs. With that, this is a simple slide, just going over some of the power of the Home Depot Pro, our ability to deliver products to your job sites, um, our ability to work with you and really become that trusted advisor, right? To help you solve those challenges on your jobs. We believe that if we help you create simple operational efficiencies on these flips, if we can save you money and truly at the end of these jobs become more profitable, we're being successful. And the pro desks in the Orlando markets are there ready to support your business needs um, at all, you know, at any moment. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jay and Buffy. I'm going to stop sharing here. And I just want to say thank you for your business at the Home Depot and our stores in the market. And we hope we're earning your business. If we're not, reach out to Jay first, I would say, and the team here, because they're also an extension of us at Home Depot. And then we're there to support and bridge the gap locally with stores if needed. So thank you all. Hope you have a great evening. Thank you, Brian. We really appreciate that. Absolutely. And I know one of the questions that uh, that came up was like, you know, where, where exactly does that code go? Um, Brian, you, you might be able to explain it a little bit better than I can. I know where it goes because I've done it enough times, but you basically have to be logged into your account and go under the section where you list your cards that you're going to pay with. And there's a place for the agreement code to go in there. Is that correct? It is. It is. But just for the sake of, hey, you want to become a member, um, you got to become a member for Jay and the team to walk you through some of that, right? Um, this is this is a value that you get there, but yes, it's within the Pro Extra experience that I just showed on the phone. Um, so Jay, it's pretty simple. It's really not rocket science. We're not asking you to set up a credit card or do any of that. We're, however you pay at the Home Depot. I don't care if you're using a business Amex. I don't care if you're using this card or a Home Depot commercial card, however you pay, you just need to add it to the Pro Extra so we can track it, make your life a little bit easier. You don't need to find those receipts anymore. And that's how we can then allocate for the financial uh, re rebate back to you as a, as, a, as a member of CFRI. So I hope that helps. So, so yeah. what we're gonna do is because we are having a CFRI members only event after this, uh, Brian, I've given you the credentials to get into that. And we'll start off in a big room and people can talk to Brian and ask Brian questions. It'll just be members only, Brian. So it'll make a lot more sense since this is, is a members only benefit. And then we will um, break into some breakout groups as well. But we'll start off with Brian and probably Peter and Dave in case people had some questions that are, if you're a CFRI member, if you're not a member, do that three month trial membership right now. So Absolutely. thank you, Brian. We will see you at 835. Indeed. And, and um, Jenny brought up a really good point that I do want to make because I've had this experience too. And um, that is if you're going to use the program with Home Depot and your card gets cloned and it gets replaced, don't forget to update the number online because otherwise Home Depot can't track it and you won't get credit. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, we are going to transition. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. One more thing. Just remember, we're not using the chat. I can chat to you all. Um, but you can't chat back. So we're going to use the Q&A. You can chat to me, actually. You just can't chat to everyone. But we're going to use that Q&A. We're going to ask you to hold your questions for um, our, our attorney panel until the end because they've already been submitted. A bunch of people already submitted a lot of questions and they're ready to answer those questions. And we'll see if we have some time at the end to answer additional questions. Correct, Greg, Jay? That's absolutely right. You, uh, you read my mind. <laughs> So no um, raising your hand, don't any of that. You got to ask it through Q and A, and we're going to hold off on those questions until the end. Yeah, definitely. Our uh, our panel is going to have some really good information for you. Whatever questions you have, make a note of those. When we get to the Q and A portion, make sure you enter those in the Q and A section, and we'll get to them. Now I'm going to uh, transition it over to a good friend of mine, Tim Davis, who is going to take the opportunity to introduce everybody on the panel and let you learn, know a little bit more about what's going on with this uh, fantastic set of information we're gonna learn tonight that I'm really looking forward to. So Tim, all over to you. 
Well, thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, I feel very honored to be in the presence of some of the fantastic uh, people that we have on this panel tonight. And so um, just a little bit about me. I'm, my name is Tim Davis and I am the, the landlording focus group leader. And so we're gonna be talking about landlording tonight and some of the laws and some of the things that have, have happened over the last year. And we got a great group of uh, panelists here. So I'm gonna ask each one of them to go ahead and introduce themselves and tell, tell us a little bit about themselves. And I'm gonna start with uh, Mrs. Jane Bond right next to me. Well, she's in, in my picture, she's right next to me. So I'm gonna ask her if she'll go ahead and introduce herself. Good evening, I'm Jane Bond. I'm married to Greg Bond. He's right here with me. And he is the treasurer of CFRI. So some of you may know him better than you know me. I work at the law firm of McCalla Raymer Liebert Pierce. I manage the litigation department for Florida. Our firm is in 13 states. So if you own property in other states, we can help you in many of our states. Um, we also have a national eviction program. So some of you are on here to hear about landlord tenant rights and uh, I'm glad to be here to help answer questions for you and to learn more from all the other attorneys and from the people attending. Thank you, Jane, I appreciate that. And next I'd like to ask uh, Roland Acosta to introduce himself. Hello everyone, I'm Roland Acosta with Acosta Moore and Schrader. I've been practicing law for more than 45 years, believe it or not. Uh, I've been in Central Florida for 35 years. Um, when I came here, I was recruited to be Associate General Counsel of SunTrust. I did that for 14 years. 20 years ago, I went back into private practice. I worked for a very large real estate law firm. Uh, 12 years ago, I opened my own firm and focus primarily on real estate law. I have uh, been a member of CFRI for most of the time that I've had my own law firm. And I really believe in working with investors. I like working with investors because what you guys do is very inventive, creative, and it makes my job interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan, appreciate that. And uh, next, Charles Castellan. Good evening. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for inviting me to, to be on this panel. I've known my colleagues for years, and we have a very great distinguished team here. Uh, been practicing since 1992, first in New York and then in Florida since 2002. And I've been a CFRI member for over a decade now. And I just want to give a plug uh, more, more for CFRI than, than for myself, uh, especially if we have any new members in attendance, like people who've joined since the, the dumpster fire that was 2020. Uh, I think you're gonna, you're gonna get a lot out of your membership. I've met so many friends like Tim and uh, clients, business partners uh, through my membership at CFRI and I promise you'll get a great ROI. Uh, I had uh, been running my own practice for about 10 years until the end of 2018. And when I closed my practice and I joined a larger firm and was able to unload a lot of the stress of running the smaller firm and, and benefit from a, a much bigger uh, team, much greater resources. So now I work for Wiederman Malik based in Melbourne and I work out of the celebration office, like uh, the outpost of our firm. And uh, my, my focus is still on real estate, but also estate planning, which has been a growing part of my practice the last few years. And I wanna continue moving in that direction to help uh, not just investors, but families and small business owners uh, protect their families and business uh, in case of dis disability, death, uh, lawsuits, all the bad things that could happen. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Charles. And last but not least, we have Ed Miner on. If you'd like to introduce yourself for us. Hello, I'm Edward Miner. I've practiced in Orlando since 1994. Probably the last 15 years, I've just done residential evictions for other investors. I'm a buy and hold investor. I have um, many mobile homes and single family homes that I 
rent out and I practice law to support my rental habit. So thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, let me, um, I just want to give everybody a little heads up. I am not in Florida tonight. I am actually in Arizona and I'm in a hotel room. So hopefully this internet connection lasts the whole time. I'm, I'm not sure how it's going to last because I'm not familiar with it. But if for some reason I freeze up or I disappear, um, I'm sure Buffy or Jay can jump right in and, and help out a little bit. But um, I'm actually flying back to Florida tomorrow, but uh, they asked me to do this and I was very pleased to be able to, to help out with our uh, membership. So let's get into the $100,000 question. Can a landlord, and this is for everybody, I want everybody to comment on this first one. Can a landlord actually evict tenants in Florida right now? Jane, what do you think? Well, I've actually handled some. And so, yes, the answer is yes, you can evict. There are some, you know, exceptions and some cautions on that. And many of us have heard of the CDC order, which is out there. And the CDC order covers some tenants. However, you usually can still file your eviction and maybe not always, but usually, and that's a defense they can raise in the eviction. And I'm sure Ed probably has handled some of those maybe already, but then you can actually um, defend against that. And as the landlord, bring up your you know, defenses and see what they have to say under the CDC. And if you're not sure what the CDC covered people are, the tenants, they actually have to um, sign a declaration is what it is called, that they have made their best efforts to get government assistance, that they earn no more than $99,000 in annual income for 2020 for a single person or $198,000 as a married couple filing jointly. They cannot make a full rent payment because of loss of income, layoff, loss of work hours, or extraordinary medical expenses, that they are making their best effort to make timely payments as close to the full payment as possible. And if evicted, they would become homeless, need to live in a shelter, or need to move into a shared residence where they would be very close living quarters, which may cause COVID problems and they understand that they may be required by their landlord to provide full or all payments when the moratorium ends. Now, most of us probably will never see that full payment and I'm sure we know that, but even with you know, all of this with, from the CDC, um, I have handled evictions where we've gone totally through the eviction process and the writ of possession has been executed and the sheriff has helped escort the people, you know, the tenants out of the house. So it can be done. And that is for non-payment of rent? That is for non-payment of rent. Oh, they didn't raise the CDC defense. And I think that um, you'll probably have other people, they have to sign that under the penalty of perjury and they can have criminal charges brought against them. So they, you know, some of them, some tenants may not know about this, but some may know and not want to sign it because they think that if it was brought up in court and evidence was presented, you know, did you apply for the government programs? What's your amount of income? You know, all these different factors that we can actually bring evidence to show that they aren't a covered person under the CDC order. Interesting. Ed, have you had to evict anyone out of your uh, properties that you own? No, fortunately, I did get a uh, certificate of title back on a mortgage foreclosure back March 31st. I got the final judgment, but I couldn't get the writ of possession until late October because of the stay on evictions and moratoriums. But I've filed throughout this 
period, a lot of times the clerk wouldn't issue the summons. The state did not open up the evictions until October. Uh, and then they came up with the CDC order and I've had a few filed against me and those are, they stop them dead in your track. And it takes a, any smart tenant 30 seconds to look that up and download it, sign it and send it in. So I fear if they keep extending it, it could really upset the whole business. I, I think I agree. Roland, what, what is your take on that? Well, I, I would echo what everyone else said. Uh, I have effectively evicted people since the governor stopped his moratorium, which happened at the end of September. Uh, we've regularly gotten people out of these properties since that time. The uh, moratorium in, for the state has ended, as I said, at the end of September. Uh, the CARES Act moratorium ended on January 31st. I don't think it's been extended. The CDC has extended their moratorium all the way through uh, March the 31st. But the CDC um, moratorium is very, very restrictive. It can only, you can only use the CDC protection if you can uh, say that you have a uh, a reduction in income due to COVID and that you can't pay your rent. And then you've got to sign this very elaborate declaration and it's under penalty of perjury. So not everybody's gonna qualify for it. And even under the CDC um, mandate, which I believe really is extremely controversial, I think it's unconstitutional. I don't think, I think a lot of state judges are not gonna uphold it or even it will ignore it. Um, I think that you have situations that you, you have a lot of exemptions from it. Uh, there are certain situations and it's in the, the act says it and I can read it here. Um, some of the exceptions are if it's any, if you're evicting for anything other than non-payment of rent. For example, if you are evicting for other violations of the lease provisions uh, because of some criminal activity, uh, any threat in health or safety or other that you're uh, affecting the health or safety of other residences um, that you are uh, damaging or pose a, a possible damage to property, uh, you're violating a building code or health or safety code or other contractual obligations other than the payment of rent. So I have a particular situation, which I'm handling right now, where someone has brought up the CDC defense and they filed the declaration and everything else. But we based our eviction on the fact that the lease terminated mm -hmm. and that we filed the, the 15 day notice because it was a month to month tenancy under the state statute. Although there are arguments to the contrary, I do think that's an effective uh, exemption from the CDC order. Um, there, there's arguments about it, but I'm certainly gonna try it. And I'm not gonna stop evicting people, no matter what. I, I, we, I think you push, you push, and you see what the judges push back. I think a lot of the judges in the states are probably not going to enforce this unless it's, they feel compelled to. And I do think a lot of the judges do think the CDC order is unconstitutional. That's interesting. Char Charles, what's your take on, on that? One important takeaway from, from what my colleagues have been saying is that all these government related uh, eviction restrictions and moratoria really apply to the removal of the tenant not the filing of the case. And removal is just the final step right. of an eviction case. And it's, it's not automatic. We've been talking about this declaration that needs to be signed and some, some initiative that the tenant needs to take. So I think the common misconception is that all evictions are stopped in their tracks, which even though they've been severely restricted, uh, that's not the case. Very good. That's some interesting things that uh, Roland, you said something about it being unconstitutional. And I'd like you to, 
to kind of uh, give us a little bit more understanding of that, because I think you have a good point there, because the government has stepped in and done a lot of things. They've kind of gone out of their way and, and told us what we can do with our property, which, you know, our, our country was based on property rights. And so, so expound on that a little bit more about, uh, about wh how you feel this might be unconstitutional, the CDC ruling. Well, I can tell you that it's been challenged in just about every state in the country, uh, claiming unconstitutionality. One of the things that this CDC is a federal agency. It's, it's a regulatory body. What they're doing is going against state law. And in, in, in one case, they're saying that a state statute cannot be enforced because of a regulatory body that's not an elected official. You know, we do have the supremacy clause, which means that Congress can pass a law perhaps that can override a state law. But now you're talking about some agency that's not elected to anything that's nullifying state statute. I just don't, I don't understand how that's constitutional. And I think it's being challenged. Of course, it's got to all, go all the way to the Supreme Court before it's finally decided. But believe me, they're taking it through the court system and it is being challenged. The reason that they say they have the authority to do that is because of public safety. They say this is necessary. Well, I don't know that it's so necessary because they have all these exemptions from it. So it's not, for example, um, yeah, they're concerned about the spreading of COVID, but whether you can't pay your rent um, and, and uh, you, you don't wanna be evicted for that, what's the difference if somebody is doing something to the property, if, they, if they've broken some law, they're still being kicked on the street. So the disease is still being spread. So the fact that there's an exemption from it I think tells the tale, you know, I, it's either all or nothing. Either you can evict because of the fear of, this, of the disease or you can evict. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't see how this is an exceptional circumstance. Anyway, it's, you know, it's cutting, you know, it, it's very difficult. It's, an, it's a difficult argument. But I think the thing that sticks in my craw is you have a regulatory body telling a state what it can and cannot do. And I don't think that regulatory body has the authority to do that. I have a copy of an order from a judge in Escambia County who ruled that the CDC stay was a violation of the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution and a violation of Article X of the Florida Constitution and he, even though the tenant filed the CDC declaration signed, but didn't, didn't send it until the time he should have been um, removed from his property at the writ of possession stage. And the judge said that the um, CDC stay would be lifted and he would not, um, he would allow the tenant to be removed from the property. So there are judges in Florida that are listening to some of these arguments and ruling in the favor of the landlord. So that's you know, good news for everyone who's trying to evict and may get a CDC declaration filed. And that brings me to another question that's on this list here. Um, how, how many of you have been involved in the remote uh, courthouses? Because with the closing of a lot of the courthouses, what are they doing? They're, they're doing similar to what we're doing with the Zoom. And so you've had judges and, and you've had to do these, these hearings right online. Isn't, isn't that correct? That's correct. Um, almost all the hearings we attend now are online. There's a few counties now that are doing the hearings in person. Seminole County has a judge that's doing in-person hearings. Um, some of the remote counties are doing the hearings in person, but for the most part, we're just like we are today with the judge, the court reporter, um, the witnesses all on the screen. We're actually 
presenting evidence on the screen and we're sharing screens just like we share screen for the PowerPoint for the CFRI meeting. So it's been very interesting um, doing them online. And there is a little funny uh, article written by a judge in South Florida where he said, um, He's seeing all kinds of things when people appear online. People in their bathing suits with a bathing suit cover up and somebody in their bed doing their hearing with the covers over them. So, you know, he, his whole suggestion was make sure you're dressing appropriately. So I think we're gonna see, um, you know, many different things by doing the Zoom hearings, but so far they're going well. And I think everyone's liking them. And a lot of the judges wanna continue many of their hearings online. That's yeah. right. I haven't uh, been to court face to face with the judge for the last nine months. And I've, I've done not only evictions, but I've done bankruptcy work. I've done, in fact, the bankruptcy court, nobody can get in. I mean, you don't do face to face in bankruptcy court for anything. Everything is a Zoom. Um, in certain courts, uh, it's Zoom. Certain courts are, um, what is it? Uh, the um, the other, uh, uh, Skype? yeah, it's not Skype, it's, it's um, Microsoft Teams, I'm sorry. Okay. A few of the courts do Microsoft Teams, which I don't like as much as Zoom, but um, we're all remotely. I, I haven't been face to face in, with, in the presence of a judge in eight or nine months. So do you feel like that has slowed the process down or is it speeding it up or is it making it more efficient or, or what do you feel? Well, I think the courts, it, a lot of some, certain courts are, are more efficient than others. A lot of courts uh, personnel are working remotely and that is affecting the filing of things. Sometimes things don't get filed as quickly or don't show up on the docket as quickly but it's working, it's just working not quite as efficiently as it, as it was before. The Zoom hearings themselves are, I prefer it. You know, we save a lot of times being able to do this from our office rather than have to travel to the courthouse, wait your turn, and you're just, you know, twiddling your thumbs. I can do work up until time, you know, where the judge is available. So the Zoom hearing is much, much more efficient for I think most of our attorneys. Clients aren't getting billed for travel time, so that's good. <laughs> the problem I've seen, though, is I used ex party a lot to push my evictions through quickly and getting in front of a judge and presenting your paperwork and it really pushed things along. Now I have to have my process server drop off all the defaults at the judge's mailbox and I have to wait until they're signed and it could be a week after these judgments are signed until the final judgments are uploaded into the uh, system so I can't get the writ so it has delayed it a lot and I do agree with the uh, zoom meetings you can work but there is also a lot to be said of being in front of a judge in person and the courthouse when I've been down there, it's all, there's all the guards are there, but no judges are there. It's very eerie and, <laughs> and, and it's very scary. It's like you're practicing law behind a mirror. You know, you don't know what's on the other side. So I do miss the ex party and I do miss being in front of the judges. Well, I, I think all of us are suffering from personal interaction so it, it it may it may be one of those things that once we finally are able to do it again that that uh, we may go away from this zoom for for quite a while but we'll see um, so so are the sheriffs delivering the writ of possession now have you experienced that or or what, what are your thoughts on that have you seen that happen I've personally seen it happen, yes. The sheriffs are delivering it. Uh, number one, uh, if the judge orders it, um, the, the sheriff, the clerk is gonna write it and the sheriff is gonna deliver it. So it, it really is up to the judge. That's the key point. If the judge orders it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be done. 
In most counties, we haven't had any problems, but in Miami-Dade County, the sheriffs aren't ex executing the writs. So they're still not executing the writs. Mm -hmm. okay. There's some kind of county moratoria where uh, the, um, there's some kind of, you know, order from the mayor that evictions aren't to take place. So the sheriffs are not executing on the writs. And that's been a very big problem in that county. Right. So most other counties, they are? I haven't had any problems in the counties where I've done the evictions, getting the sheriffs to execute the writs. I don't know of anything in central Florida that, that would prohibit that, that I'm aware of. Okay, now I know when this first started way back in March, April of 2020, they originally uh, came up with that CARES Act, which um, had a lot to do with any federally backed mortgages. Does that still apply or has the CARES Act gone away? Has that sunsetted or what's the situation with that? The CARES Act was effective through December 31st of 2020. However, some of the provisions are still being enforced. For instance, the um, loan forbearance provision has been extended through March 31st of 2021. So if you're an owner of the property, the landlord, you can still request your initial loan forbearance. You could do that today on a federally backed mortgage and it, and then you could request it for up to um, 180 days and another 180 days. So it'd be effective through one year from today if you requested it today. So that is still something that's in effect and you can use. Many of the large banks are also extending that to um, all their conventional loans. So, you know, their programs may be the same as, and when I say government back loans, that's Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, USDA. So there is um, always the opportunity under the CARES Act, you have to request it and you have to say you've been financially affected um, by COVID-19 during that pandemic period. It doesn't have to, you know, it can be that you lost some income or whatever, but that should be enough and just affirmatively to ask for it. And usually they'll give it to you for 180 days. Then they'll call you up and see how you're doing. And if you say you still need another 180 days, they'll give you another 180 days. And that's been very helpful to some landlords who have government back loans and their tenants aren't paying. So Jane, if, if you um, take the forbearance, because this is an interesting topic. I don't think we've even talked about it at our landlording meeting yet. If you do take the forbearance, is there, do different banks have different policies on what you have to do at the end? Like pay it all up at one time or can you put it at the end of the loan? Do you know any of those details? Yes, it's usually based on the investor on the loan. So if it's um, Fannie or Freddie, they will allow you, ooh, somebody's dog's barking. It's not mine this time, but um, they will allow you to keep it until your loan is due. If you pay your loan off or at the end of your loan, that amount has to be repaid. So it's loan deferment is what they call it. And it goes to the end of your loan. Many of them have very good modification programs they'll put you into. Or if you want to, you can pay it off at the end of your forbearance period. But most of us like to delay that payment if we can. Um, but you know, if you get a windfall of money some way, you may want to just take care of it then. But I, that's you know, very beneficial. Also, according to the CARES Act, um, while you're in forbearance, there should be no negative credit reporting. And many people are worried about negative credit reporting or that this will end up um, on their credit report, but they are not supposed to um, report it at all. You're supposed to be pretty much treated as if you are current during your forbearance period. And that's interesting. Um, I saw some potential legislation that may be coming out 
uh, very soon about not uh, about, I guess, expunging evictions reporting for 2020. If you got evicted during 2020 that um, you're not, well, I don't know if they were going to take it off your record or if they were going to tell landlords they couldn't uh, use that against someone or, or something like that. Does anybody know anything about that legislation that's coming out? I haven't heard about that. You haven't seen that? Haven't. Okay. I just heard about it like two days ago. And it's some some potential legislation that's that's saying that if you were evicted during the COVID period, that um, I don't know if they were saying that that landlords couldn't hold it against you or that it had to be removed from your record. But um, so, so what is the potential of something like that? Do you, do you have any opinion if something like that were to be um, proposed as legislation? What do you think chances of that going through would be? And that's for the state of Florida. That was not a national thing, that was uh, Florida. Well, one of the things that I, I, you know, I can understand why they're doing it, but um, it, I really would recommend all landlords to make sure that they screen potential tenants very carefully for evictions, for uh, credit reports. Uh, I have seen some horrible situations where because a screening wasn't done, you get one of these professional derelicts that uh, that get into property, and it it's, it takes a shoehorn and a lot of time and a lot of money to get them out. There are professional people that literally are uh, they know the landlord tenant law better than the attorneys do, and they're really really good at living for free. So I, I you know I think it's it's I understand why the legislation would be passed. But I do think screening, proper screening, is extremely important. Very good. Um, There's another thing that we should talk about, though, and this this is the CARES Act. You know, the CARES Act moratorium has ended for sure, but there's still important provisions in the law that still is very battle, uh, valid. One is the rental, uh, the CARES Act rental relief. Uh, that uh, landlords can apply to get and tenants can apply to get their rent money paid. I believe at the end of uh, December, December 27th, I think Congress passed $25 billion uh, in aid uh, to pay for this rent that both the tenant and the landlord can apply for so that the, the, um, the landlord and the, well, the tenant can get his rent paid by the government, direct aid from the government. Um, the landlord himself can apply for it as long as the tenant will agree to, um, to cooperate and give the information necessary to, um, to, to get the program in place. Uh, it's, it's a program in which the payment goes directly to the landlord or to the utility company. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go to the, the tenant. If the landlord doesn't want to participate, the, la uh, the tenant themselves can apply for it directly and payment will be made to the tenant to give to the landlord. It's, it's a pretty good program. It's a program that most landlords should know about because if, if these tenants are gonna be there, uh, obviously the, the landlord wants to try to get as much rent as it can. So how does someone find out about that particular program and where should they go to find the information about that, Roland? It's all distributed locally. Uh, you have to go to, to, it's not national, you go to the state government, no, normally the county, I'm sure Orange County will have a pro, uh, will be able to give you information about rental relief under the CARES Act. I also just posted on the chat several different ways you can get uh, information on assistance. And um, one of them is called Financial Assistance for Housing in Florida. One is called Florida 211 the National United Way, um, Find Help Aunt Bertha Services Directory, and Catholic Charity Services and Assistance. And 
when I did research on this, I couldn't believe um, that they were using United Way and Catholic Charities, but they're using different ways to distribute this money. But I especially found it interesting on Find Help Aunt Bertha Services Directory, and it's um, findhelp.org. You put in your zip code that you need the assistance for. And I typed in, I live in Castleberry, so I put in 32707, that's my zip code and 53 organizations offering assistance came up that they could you know, look into. Oh. Yeah. And I put in 32801 because my office is in Orlando, downtown Orlando, and 65 help organizations came up. And it was really interesting because there was rental assistance for musicians and rental assistance for people working in the arts and rental assistance for first responders. And so there's all these different categories of assistance. And if you know, you're know you a landlord trying to help out your tenants to get money to pay you, um, I know from our own rentals, my husband and I have some, that we received a check from um, one of the Volusia County assistants for $4,000 because our tenant was behind you know, several thousand dollars. And when you get a $4,000 check, you're like, yes. So there is money available if they um, will look for it. And if you can help your tenants apply for it or give them this information, it may be a way for you to get money if you think um, you're not gonna be able to evict them. And the interesting thing was we got that money after we evicted our tenant. So you know, it was money that they had applied for because they were in arrears. So there are ways, and you know, I that Aunt Bertha and many of these don't only give um, assistance for rental; it's food and other services. So I would highly recommend um, making a copy of these websites and using them um, if you can with your tenants. Very good. So. I know that there's different reasons to evict tenants. N not only is uh, non-payment um, one of the reasons, but you know, uh, I think Roland, you alluded earlier to um, people working towards getting tenants out because their contract's over. And um, and then there's also if they break some other rule, um, you can issue a seven-day non-curable notice or even a seven day curable if they don't cure it and and you can get them out and we've had some experience with that um have has there ever through this whole COVID thing has there been any any reason that they would stop that type of eviction Well, as long as the government's a governor's moratorium was in, eviction stopped in the state of Florida. They loosened up a great deal after the um, after the end of September when he's when the governor stopped the moratorium, and they were under these federal mandates. Um, I think, like I said, I think the judges were a little bit reluctant to enforce these mandates. I don't know if people were even bringing them up as because you have to bring it up as a defense. I mean, some of the tenants weren't even aware of it, weren't bringing it up, weren't defending themselves. So um, the judges were going to enforce it unless, unless there was some reason, unless it was pushed back by the tenants. So I did notice that once the governor's moratorium ended, that it was much easier to you know, get people out of these properties for any number of reasons. All right. So is it, in, well, you've already answered this question, Roland, um, how important it is for screening tenants. Um, if you had a crystal ball, what's your word to the wise going forward as a landlord? And I'll let you, each, each of you comment on that. Screen your tenants extremely well be prepared for long delays 
and evicting, it's the process has slowed down considerably where I could get them evicted. My record was nine days. I'm still working on one that's two years old, but it takes more time. Um, and be prepared. The business going forward, we're moving out of the justice world into social justice. And like where you mentioned that there could be uh, laws passed where you can't use a prior eviction criminal record against renting to somebody because that could be uh, construed as discrimination or so. Going forward, I'd be very cautious. I have an answer that a lot of landlords won't like, which is diversify and don't limit yourself to being a residential landlord uh, because it's a lot, a lot of eggs in one basket. Uh, but if you don't like that answer, I think uh, using a professional property manager is a very smart thing to do, especially for all these legal landmines, like what Ed just mentioned has been a, a cutting edge issue in recent years uh, about uh, uh, fair housing discrimination claims based on criminal convictions. And I think that's gonna go all the way to the Supreme Court uh, eventually. So between that and emotional support animals and, and all, all these rapidly changing laws, I think having a good professional who keeps up with, with these, uh, these developments is uh, a great asset to a landlord. Yeah, I think there are a lot of hazards when, when you're a landlord. There are a lot of, you know, I, I, I emphasize screening because I do think it's very important. Uh, also, probably personal interviews because sometimes you can tell you just have a bad feeling about somebody. And I don't know if you can deny them uh, <laughs> to rent because you have a bad feeling. But, you know, as long as you're not personally discriminating or using a reason to not rent for uh, rent uh, to them. Um, you know, I, I just think it's dangerous and uh, today in today's world. Um, the, a good point that Charles brought up is about these emotionally support animals. I've seen so much abuse uh, about this where people uh, somebody maybe doesn't want to rent to people with pets. And, and uh, so they, it's, it's not about, about uh, refusing rent to somebody who happens to be handicapped. You just don't want pets in your property. And they will use this emotional support animal when it's not even valid. And, you know, because you can't challenge it. If they say it's an emotional support animal, they don't have to prove it. That's all they have to do is say it. And you can't, you cannot challenge it. So it's, again, you've got some very, um, it's, it's what's coming up and what can come up particularly with the administration that we have now, if it goes further um, into this social justice thing or whatever you wanna call it, I think it's gonna be harder and harder and harder to not rent your property to whomever just applies. I agree with hiring a property manager. My husband spent many hours uh, doing repairs to properties when he could have spent his time doing other things when we first got started. And he'll second that, that he would rather be, um, you know, use a property manager than do the work himself. Also, um, green tenants, as they said, is important. And I put in, if you can't get the tenant out um, easily when they're violating the lease for some reason, especially non-payment of rent, just by a friendly little agreement, then file your eviction paperwork immediately. Make sure you do your three-day notice and you do the steps as quickly as possible because if you do and they don't file a defense, you can usually get your eviction done in most, most counties, you know, in central Florida within a month and have them out. So if you work quickly, um, that's helpful. And if you think you're being a nice landlord by listening to their complaints and their, um, you know, the reason they aren't doing this, if you fix that and the other thing, they'll pay and many of their other ways they delay. If you have a date, if you have a court date, that gets them to call you or at least see you at the courthouse if they're going to um, talk to you or make any payment. So 
I say do it quickly. You'll have a resolution more quickly. You either have them out or you will get them um, to the bargaining table much more quickly. Very good. So here's some questions from the, the chat and um, or the Q and A, I should say. Um, the, the forbearance covers the mortgage, but is there any relief for property tax? And what if property taxes and insurance are escrowed in the mortgage payment? What happens with that? Any thoughts? Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly what they're gonna do with all that. Um, I represent a lot of the large lenders in our firm and there's been some, um, you know, some talking about that, but you know, they're not supposed to charge penalties and interest and all these different things. But I know the escrow has, you know, become some concern. Um, so I would think, you know, whatever you owe, you're going to owe at the end or sometimes, but as long as they haven't included um, the penalties and the things they're not supposed to include under the CARES Act, that's the way it will work. But I don't have the specifics on the escrow. Is there, do you know of any tax relief where the, the local governments have, have said anything about that or? I don't know of any tax relief. No. We always pay our taxes, right? <laughs> you might get some breaks on our income tax because of our depreciation, but they're not gonna give us breaks on the property tax. That's true. Um, so in the case of an ejectment, which is different from a, from a uh, eviction, can a COVID can the COVID defense be used for that, or is it, or is the CDC just for evictions? Well, it's interesting um, because when is <laughs> an eviction requires a lease? That's a prerequisite, either an oral or a, a written lease, and an obligation to pay rent. An ejectment, there is no lease involved. Normally it's a situation where someone is in the property and you want them out of the property, but it's not a situation with the lease. It could be a circumstance in which, for example, um, I had a case uh, that turned into an ejectment. I tried to get them out with an unlawful detainer, but it became an ejectment uh, because the person who we tried to get gone happened to be the daughter and she claimed that her mother bought the property with her inheritance. So she was claiming an interest in the property. And that's all you have to do to have an ejectment, claim some sort of interest in the property. The difference between an ejectment and an unlawful detainer is where you don't have an interest in the property. A squatter, for example, would be unlawful detainer or a boyfriend that moves into the property that's not on the lease and now the girlfriend wants him gone and he won't leave. That's unlawful detainer. The difference between the two is unlawful detainer requires a five day summons and you can go to county court. If it's an ejectment, it's a 20 day summons and you have to be in circuit court. So if you file an unlawful detainer and then begin to claim the person, the defendant claims an interest in the property, then you gotta move it to circuit court and you, it, it, it just fouls things up. So there's a distinct difference between an ejectment, an unlawful detainer, and an eviction. And obviously you have to file the correct cause of action in order to progress get, with getting the person out of the property. We just had an unlawful detainer action against um, a property where a CFRI investor um, owned a property in Sanford, but it ended up becoming a drug haven. And all these people were in there, you know, the drug houses with many occupants. And the sheriff was so glad that we filed it because he had said he had been at that house 20 times. 
at, you know, in the recent history. And so he was so glad to actually have that unlawful detainer action and be able to remove all of those occupants of that house who are not there by any possessory right whatsoever. So Roland's exactly right. That's, that's how that's used and it's used successfully sometimes. And the CDC order does not apply because that was recent. Very good. Um, here's a note from uh, Rob Arnold. He, he posted in the question and answer for, for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and read it. But he is monitoring the anti-landlord bills that have been proposed in Tallahassee. And if any of them start to make any traction, he's gonna let all the membership know. Um, so if you have questions, you can uh, email him at CFRI legislative chair at gmail.com and that should uh, help you with those things. I know that that, uh, that one bill that I was talking about a little earlier was I think something that I saw come up and I think Rob did comment on that, so. Yeah, he, um, he had actually posted several in the CFRI Facebook group. Uh, I think that one might've been SB 926 that he was referring to, but there were several that he posted on that are in there. So anybody that's part of that group can go take a look because they're there. Yeah. So thank you all very much for all your, your knowledge and your information. I think you've done a fantastic job. I don't know if there's any more questions out there. I don't see any more in the Q and A that we haven't answered. Anybody? It's time to put them in the Q and A. Do all of you all, oh, do you have that last question that I put in? Did you see my last question on the list of questions? The crystal ball? Tim? Oh, yes, yes, I did. I did ask the <laughs> question about the, about the crystal ball. Okay. But, so Mark Johnson just asked, um, if you're, if your property is privately funded, is it easier to evict a resident? And do the residents have any rights which would stop an eviction from non-payment or non-compliance? Well, it, if, it, it doesn't matter, uh, it ha how to say this, the CARES Act, the CARES Act uh, moratorium uh, had covered properties and to apply uh, for the moratorium, have the moratorium apply for the CARES Act, it had to be federal related loan. So if it was private loan or you owned it outright and there was no loan, then the CARES Act moratorium never applied. But the CARES Act moratorium uh, no longer applies. It's, it's, been, it's gone. The moratorium that is in effect right now is the CDC. And that applies to any property, whether it's federally funded or not. And we discussed, you know, the, 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 um, how that moratorium is narrowly applied. I mean, it, you can get around it. It, it has to fit that, those sets of circumstances. Right. Um, so can a person be evicted or can a person that is being evicted ask for a jury trial and get one in the eviction case to delay it? <laughs> uh, I've never seen that asked for, or uh, I've never seen that happen. Um, supposedly we have a constitutional right to a jury trial if you're an individual. Um, it's an interesting question. I, I, I've, never see, I've never seen anybody do that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I, I would assume you can, I just never seen it done. Yeah, I think if you pay the rent into the court registry, you could probably get a jury trial. But talking about unlawful detainer actions, the statute is very poorly written and unlawful detainer actions uh, apply to a guest, somebody who may a squatter in your property, or you evict one tenant and they leave behind residents. But in the uh, unlawful detainer action, they can ask for jury trials. 
and they can become very complicated quickly. But one of the key things with an unlawful detainer action, it's somebody who's you invited on the property or they moved in there without your permission. There's no landlord tenant relationship. So that's a big difference between an unlawful detainer action and moving forward in this environment with the evictions with the CDC order, if there is no lease and you're on a month to month tenancy, I would advise terminating the lease and then suing on a non-renewal or termination of tenancy versus a three day notice, which is covered by the CDC more to, you know, the CDC act. Someone asked this. I, I have that. exactly that situation whereby um, we did file not based upon uh, non-payment of rent uh, because this was a this was a, a deadbeat uh, tenant. Um, the lease terminated in 2018. He hadn't paid rent even before the lease terminated. He's, it has nothing to do with the CDC or the, the, you know, the COVID or anything else. He's using the CDC declaration to try to stay there. But what we did was we filed based upon, we gave a 15 day notice based upon a month to month tenancy. That was the reason that we, we, we went that route because we knew this guy was a complete deadbeat. We knew he would try to use the CDC. We knew it before he, he filed it. So that's the route we went. I think it'll, I, that's the argument I'm gonna use um, because I think that that is, is possible an argument that can defeat the CDC de defense. Very good. So uh, do you feel that like the uh, moratoriums have, have caused uh, such a backup that there's gonna be some kind of tsunami of foreclosures or or uh, evictions coming up this year? Yes, I, I definitely think there's going to be a, a lot of that. I think there's gonna be a, a huge, once the floodgates open, once the courts, are, uh, once the moratoriums are over with, I think there's gonna be enormous uh, foreclosures, enormous evictions. I think there's gonna be a large bankruptcy filing you can't keep receiving government money forever and you can't kick that down that can down the road without it finally uh, w without a, a, an outcome like that. I, I just don't, I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna see where we thought 2008 was bad. There's nobody, this is gonna be another depression. I mean, we are really, we're in for a really, really hard time. I, I, I expect, a, a spike in foreclosures, but I disagree with Roland to the extent that it'll be worse than 2008. And I think the main difference is there's a lot more equity right now. Back then in 2008, when you just needed a pulse to get a mortgage, the valuations got wildly uh, overstated and uh, everybody was just getting these crazy products and, and uh, with the adjustable, the arms, and, uh, and all the crazy lending products and, and prices were, were just crazy inflated, which led to the short sale crisis. I think what's gonna happen, and, and I've even written a webinar that I'm gonna launch to help investors buy foreclosures, is you're gonna have a lot of uh, distressed homeowners sitting on equity and motivated to sell to pocket it and move on. So I don't know, I've been wrong before, we'll see. Well, and Fannie and Freddie um, right now have their moratorias through February um, 28th and USDA and um, FHA have them through um, 331-21, but many are predicting that these moratorias on foreclosures are gonna last until September of 2021. So if that happens, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, the end of the year or next year before we see the real spike in foreclosures. So I think we need to really watch the moratorias. And as um, Charles is saying, there's gonna be a lot of investors, all the investors out there that are looking for um, the, the deals and a lot of homeowners are looking for property. So if these go up for sale, they may uh, 
not go into foreclosure because they're going to sell either to investors or they're going to sell to um, owner occupants. So I think there's, you know, there's always exciting things for property investors when you're looking at this kind of an environment. But I, I really don't think it's going to be like, you know, the Great Recession of 2000, you know, what, six, seven through 16, 17, 18. I think we're still going to see um, less foreclosures than we saw then. Well, I absolutely agree. I think one man's loss is another man's gain. Uh, I, I am concerned, though. I do think we're going to have a downturn, and I think there's going to be a lot of displaced people. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to take a while for, for the, the country to recover because you, you, you're going to have a lot of people that are out of work. You're going to have a lot of people that uh, can't receive welfare forever. Uh, there's just a lot of displacement that's going to happen. And I do think it's going to take a while for the country to recover. So how, in, and I know that, that y'all have seen the, the, the real estate market right now is just crazy as far as prices escalating, um, you know, people fighting over houses. I guess there's a inventory lack. And then you have this whole uh, group of people that haven't paid mortgages on their houses, which kind of is like a, a, a lagging indicator that'll come into play, you know, a couple of years from now. How is that all balancing out? What do you see happening with that? I know that there's a, there's a lack of inventory and that's probably due to the crash back in 2008 because builders did not build for a long time. And so there was not enough inventory for the demand out there. But you know, what, do you, what do you think? Part of it is due to COVID as well. A lot of people are reluctant to you know, move or do much because of, uh, because of this concern for their health. So they're delaying what, what typically would be a sale, they're delaying it. Uh, and and it's, once COVID is lifted, I think the market is going to shift a lot. Um, I, I know I have a mortgage broker uh, that I work with, and for most of 2020, 85% of his business was refis and 15% were home sales. And he typically, in a normal period of time, it would be the opposite. It would be 85% would be home sales and 15% was refis. So you have a lack of inventory, you have extremely low, way, way below uh, interest rates that we haven't seen forever. So yeah. it's really encouraging a, a, a tsunami of refis. And that's where the focus is. A big problem I see is the lack of affordable housing, which the government is going to try to mandate or enforce rules and regulations. They've already raised the cost by all the building regulations. I see the rents are rising so quickly it's going to outpace the tenant's ability to pay. Uh, coupled with a severe shortage, they're not building any more low-income housing, housing under $150,000. we are seeing a lot of apartments, but those apartments are starting at you know, $1,200, $1,400 and up. So I fear the government enforcing more rules, more regulations, and uh, trying to cure this problem instead of letting the private industry uh, work on it and have our way. So I see the rising rents, the lack of inventory, and there's a lot of owners who had their tenants in their property for a long time and they're paying below market rents. Now they wanna sell their properties and these poor tenants are going to have to go out and pay market rent. So I see a lot of uh, issues on the low income tenants going forward. Good point, Ed. Good point. And Jane, your firm does a lot of foreclosures already, don't, don't you? That's we do. That's our main um, stay. We do foreclosures in all 13 states. 
And so um, have you seen more lately or is it about the well, same? Most of ours are um, either bank or the non-bank servicers. So, you know, name a mortgage servicer, we probably represent them in one of our states. And the foreclosures really, we're seeing a few more, especially from the clients who service for hedge funds or some type of non-conventional investments because it's private money. But if they're Fannie, Freddie, there's um, all the government back loans, they're still on moratoria. Um, for foreclosures, you can't file a foreclosure. You can, if you have a pending one from, you know, before COVID started, you can't sometimes go to judgment. The only exception is for vacant and abandoned property. So foreclosures have been um, historically low, very low, where foreclosure firms across the nation are going out of business. So really, it's been very difficult um, for people in you know, in my field, but our clients, we, you know, we're still getting some and they're still vacant and abandoned properties and so there's still conventional loans and private money loans. There's also fix and flips, you know, as you, uh, many people get fix and flip loans, but, you know, we see some of those too, and those are um, still going forward. So if you have fix and flip loans and you're running into trouble, know that, um, all these different moratorias don't apply because they're commercial loans. Apartments, you know, unless you have federally backed loans on your apartments and you're in a forbearance agreement as a multifamily um, owner, if you are a multifamily owner, you probably can't even evict your tenants because if you're in a forbearance, Fannie and Freddie say that you should not be evicting someone if you're receiving a forbearance on your mortgage payment as a multifamily owner. So, you know, there's different rules in there for multifamily, but, um, you know, we're seeing different types of foreclosures. It's just not the volume that we usually see. And in a market like this, or when there's this much moratoria throughout um, the system, it's probably going to be low until those are lifted. Very good. So let me ask this question. Do, do any of you uh, write leases for clients and, and would you take on any new clients? Do you write leases and do you do evictions? And if you do, are they um, like, what, what would be the average cost of an eviction for that? And if you don't do that, that's fine. But I, I do write leases uh, for uh, both residential and commercial leases, and uh, I do evict residential and commercial. Uh, a lot of times it's, uh, I will do evictions even though I haven't written the lease. Uh, there is a standard charge for uh, both uh, residential and commercial evictions. Um, they're different. Commercials evictions are a lot more expensive than residential evictions. Uh, but yeah, I, I do it all. Okay. I think, I think residential evictions and chapter sevens are the two most commoditized legal services in the business. And in my firm, we can't compete with the eviction mills. Uh, they, they just operate on volume. And uh, most of my residential evictions really wouldn't be cost effective. Commercial is a different world and it's treated more like a regular type of case. We review um, and write residential and commercial. We um, have worked with even, you know, uh, renewals for commercial properties. We also, um, Ha do handle evictions on a national basis. Some of our evictions probably would be more expensive than some of the um, eviction people who handle the high volume evictions. I know I've seen where some attorneys will handle the evictions for, you know, $175 for a single tenant. And, you know, some it's up to, you know, 350, 550. I think our firm on the evictions after a foreclosure, I think it's about $750. Um, 
So it's probably a little bit more than um, some of the high volume residential eviction, you know, that were that are for property management companies and others in the industry. Ed, do you do you do uh, evictions for other people? Yeah, I I do, and I was charging you know three twenty five, and it's gone up to three seventy five. Now I want four hundred or more because I worry about the CDC them filing that and these things going sideways, and uh, it's getting tough. It, it it's just it's really slowed down, and it, it's a it was a lot easier when it was like riding a bicycle you could file them get them out very quickly now everything is slow and it's it's tough going so i have drafted a few leases i tried to stay out of it but i think you could have a thousand page lease you can't afford to litigate it it would cost too much money in court a lot of times but just for this i've always specialized in simple residential evictions and it was a good niche and it's become a lot harder in this new world. Okay. I'm involved in a commercial eviction right now that is probably go on forever and a day. Um, it, you know, and I warn my, I warn my client because uh, we've got a, a crazy tenant that uh, is willing to fight and has the money to fight. And uh, he's one of the tenants, believe it or not, that, um, he asked for a trial. He, he did ask for a trial in this commercial eviction uh, because uh, his company is, is, is the tenant, he and his wife or the co-tenants, They both, everybody signed the lease. So it was in the, the, the company couldn't ask for a jury trial, but he personally could ask for a jury trial. I'm gonna fight it because frankly, if we get a jury trial, it'll be two or three years from now. You know, and we're trying to get him out of the property. That's exactly why he asked for a jury trial, because there's no civil jury trials happening right now. The only trials that are happening are criminal trials. And with COVID and the backlog of, uh, of civil trials, it's going to be forever and a day before we can get into a, a court with, you know, before a jury. So that's why you smiled when that question was asked a little while ago. <laughs> exactly. <huh? laughs> I, I contacted a local judge the other day and to just ask him when he thought the courthouse in Orange County would reopen. He had no clue. He even said that he had jury trials coming up in March and he didn't know if they were going to go. So he doesn't know when the courthouse is going to open or what's happening. Where I had a trial in Seminole County and that was a few months ago. So, I mean, this COVID has really upended the world. We're living in the upside down world. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, here's the, here's one last question. Can you require a tenant to get a COVID test on before you have them sign a lease? That's an interesting question. <laughs> There's got to be a law against that. <laughs> a HIPAA. <laughs> I, would, I would think there's probably a law against that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That might be discrimination, right? I think that's med medical privacy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Jay and Buffy. And thank you all very much for, for your input. It was very educational. And um, I really enjoyed moderating this tonight. And Maybe we'll do it again in the future. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tim. And why don't we go around and have uh, each one of them give their contact information if they want to, and to so that people know how to get in contact with them for, for any help that they might need. And um, Roland, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Sure. My law firm is Acosta, Moore and Schrader. The phone number is 407-644-2531. That's 407-644-2531. 2531, email is racosta at, that's the A with the circle around it, amslawfl.com. Outstanding, thank you, sir. And Jane, how about you? Mine's right up there, wherever in the corner. <laughs> Paula Raymer, Liebert Pierce, 
And my um, email address is jane.bond, not James Bond, but jane.bond at mccalla.com. And uh, my phone number is 321-332-8565. Outstanding. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate that. Uh, Ed, how about you? Uh, Edward Miner. I work you know, out of my house, uh, 407-625-8404. My email is edminer, M-E-I-N-E-R, at cfl.rr.com. Fantastic. Thank you, Ed. And Charles, we'll finish with you. It's uh, Wiederman Malik, uh, phone number 407-566-0001. And the easiest thing to do is look up our website, uslegalteam.com. Easy to remember. You'll see my smiling face on the profile. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, Tim, since you are such a great host, why don't you make sure everybody knows how to get in touch with you as well? Because you do a great job with the landlording group and did a great job tonight. And I'm sure people might have questions for you as well. Sure. Yeah. Anybody have any questions or you need any, any help? I'm always uh, there for the CFRI members. So my, my uh, contact information is T Davis at allcountymetro.com. And you can reach me at 407-624-624. 4,000. That's 407 624 4,000. My extension is 102. Fantastic. Well, again, I cannot thank you all enough. We really appreciate you being a part of part of this and being so helpful and, and uh, giving such great information to everybody tonight. Uh, again, for those folks that are members, do not forget that you have the opportunity to be a part of the meeting after the meeting. It will be a separate Zoom event. So we'll be ending this one in just a moment here. And then we'll get that one started about 835. And uh, also, if you're not a member, don't forget we're running the special and uh, that you can sign up to be a member. Can you get that on the screen there? <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, as Buffy's showing you guys the uh, link to the meeting after the meeting, or if you want to be a part of the meeting after the meeting, if you're a member, just go to the CFRI.net and click on the members only event meeting after the meeting like you're seeing Buffy do on the screen. And of course you will then use the link down at the bottom to register or pre-register for the event like she's clicking right there. And boom, you are all set. It'll send you an email or you can also scroll down the page and the link will be down there as you can see there. And that's all you gotta do. Other than that, we appreciate it. I hope everybody had a wonderful February 3rd. That is today, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh okay good just making sure all right you guys take care stay safe stay well and we'll see you again soon thanks everybody thank you bye thank you thank you